Vito Rizzuto was the epitome of a really Canadian mafia. From large-scale construction fraud to narcotics trafficking, and from stock manipulation to money laundering, Vito Rizzuto did it all. In our video today, we look at the movie-like life of Montreal's Teflon Don. In what could pass off as a Martin Scorsese movie, the story of Vito Rizzuto is intriguing, so you'd better hold on to your hats for this one. Bloody Beginnings Our story begins in Italy, and like many famous Italians, Vito Rizzuto was born in Sicily in 1946. Vito was named after his grandfather, Vito Sr. The latter left his wife and son, Nicolo, in Sicily for America in the 1920s, expecting to send money back to his family. Gangsterism appears to run in the Rizzuto family. Vito Sr. rapidly became a minor figure in the New York State criminal underworld. However, he vanished outside of Patterson, New York in 1933. His body was discovered behind a downed tree during a storm, and the coroner decided that he had been battered to death with a blunt weapon. Following his father's death, Nicolo returned to Sicily and married the daughter of a local mafia chieftain, but the family didn't stay in Italy for long. And at the age of 30, Nicolo, his wife, and Vito Jr., then nine years old, set sail for Canada, landing in Montreal. It would only take a little time for father and son to become two of the most influential people in Canadian criminal history. Nicolo, who had worldwide links to organized crime, rapidly created a gang with others from Montreal's Sicilian diaspora after arriving in Canada. The Contrani family, who were Calabrian rather than Sicilian, were the major players in Montreal at the time. The Contronis, led by Vincenzo Controni, assisted the powerful New York criminal family, the Bonanos, in turning Montreal into a drug importation hub. As Vito grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, the Controni family's prominence in Montreal's underground society rose. However, things began to deteriorate in the 1970s. During this period, Controni, the family's head, was crippled by cancer, and the two men most likely to succeed him were Nicolo and a Calabrian named Paolo Violi. The two men were rivals, with one wanting to get rid of the other for obvious reasons. Violi eventually gained control, and tensions between the Sicilians and the Calabrians intensified. Nicolo began working on his own, and his supervisors and competitors accused him of stealing money from them, a major offense in the business. The internal influence struggle between the two intensified and only lasted until Nicolo, following a rumored assassination attempt, traveled to Venezuela to meet and arrange with other drug traffickers. Nicola would strike furiously from here, igniting a brutal turf war with the Violis. Pietro Ciara's blood was the first to be spilt in the fight between the two criminal families. Ciara, who was regarded a consigliere to Violi, earned Nicolo's wrath when it was suspected that he sided with the Calabria during attempted mediation between the two. So on Valentine's Day 1976, when Ciara was leaving a Montreal theater after seeing The Godfather 2, he was killed down on the street. Nicolo apparently returned to Montreal around this time, and from there the corpse count of men related to the Violis began to rise, with the Violis themselves finally joining the pile. Francesco Violi, their muscle, who was helping manage things while Paolo was in jail, was the first of the three brothers to depart. Francesco was slain in his office by several men using shotguns who shot him in the head. Paolo was freed from prison shortly after, and although knowing he was being pursued, he refused to leave the city. Paolo met his end when he agreed to join a card game at an ice cream store where he had a connection. In the Canadian underground, the Rizzuto period had begun. The older Rizzuto dominated the turf battle in Montreal in the 1970s, while Vito mostly worked in the background. However, it wouldn't be long until Vito had blood on his hands as well. Down the Bloody Road In 1981, the Rizzuto family, now firmly in control of the Montreal scene, maintained close relations with the Bonanno family in New York. And the Bonanos had a problem in the shape of three capos, underbosses, who Joe Massino, the Bonanno's head, suspected of planning to depose him. The Rizzutos were to manage the removal of Alphonse Indelicato, Philip Giacconi, and Dominic Trinchera. So Vito and two other Montreal Sicilians allegedly went to a Brooklyn social club and hid in a closet. It's unclear what transpired, but a future turncoat, Salvatore Vitale, who claimed to be in the closet, told his side of the story in court. Vitali stated, according to Edwards, that Gerlando Siasia was to run his hands through his silver coiffure as the signal for the guys to come out. So according to Vitali, when Siasia finally ran his hands through his hair, Vito and the others allegedly burst out of the closet, with Vito exclaiming, Nobody move, this is a holdup. Rounds were fired and the three capos were found dead when the pandemonium and smoke had cleared from the chamber. These killings would later haunt Vito. 
moving up. Redemption for the killings, however, was years away, as it was the 1980s and the criminal underground in Montreal thrived throughout the 1980s. They were involved in every illicit activity imaginable, including gambling, money laundering and drug trafficking. Lots and lots of drug trafficking. They were expanding and generating money by bucket loads. But as with all good things, bad things happen. And Nicola was detained by Venezuelan authorities in 1988 on drug trafficking allegations. Nicolo, who had been acquitted at first, was sentenced to eight years in jail as a consequence of the appeal. He would serve five years. And with his father imprisoned on another continent, Vito was set to take the lead. Flourishing under new leadership. The Montreal Mafia would convert Quebec into a slick, well-oiled money-making machine under Vito's direction in the 1990s and early 2000s. Perhaps the most impressive feat Rizzuto accomplished was bringing together a large number of other gangs, gangs that would never normally associate with each other, such as biker gangs, Haitian gangs, and so on. Everyone was happy under Rizzuto leadership because everyone had a portion of the product. Vito wanted to generate money, and he realized he had to work with individuals outside of the family to do it. Their influence in the construction business rose tremendously, with a so-called mafia tax on structures reaching up to 30%. Vito had to collaborate with individuals from many walks of life in order to choreograph this empire. But there was a catch. If you were a part of it, you had to work for him. Vito was the boss. This was even done inside the family. And when Nicola was released from prison in 1993, he made way for his son. The fact that everyone was working together in a strategic consortium reduced the amount of conflict between various organizations, which in turn reduced the attention of the media and police. If you constructed something in town, chances are the Rizzutos took a share and assisted you in obtaining building licenses. If narcotics were brought into the city, chances are the Rizzutos received a piece. And if money was laundered, chances are the Rizzutos got a cut. During this period, Vito developed a reputation for being impenetrable to law enforcement, and he was dubbed Canada's Teflon Don. A bloody beginning, a bloody end. As everyone who has seen a decent crime film knows, everything started crumbling down around him. While some law enforcement officers were bought off by the gang in the mid-2000s, the majority were not, and you can guarantee they noticed when Vito grabbed control of the city. Groups of organized crime specialists were convening to investigate the Rizzuto's danger and influence. Police were entering linked organizations and listening in on Rizzuto's hangouts. Back in New York, the hammer was dropping on the Bananos, and they were swiftly turning on each other. This resulted in American police apprehending Vito in 2004 on charges related to the deaths. He battled extradition for several years, but ultimately lost in court, and was transferred to the United States to stand trial in 2006. It was here that Salvatore Vitali testified against him. Vitali informed investigators that he was in the closet with Rizzuto in 1981, and that Vito was one of the shooters. Vito was eventually convicted of racketeering and sentenced to five and a half years in prison, with credit for time previously served. He was sent to a Colorado jail to be geographically separated from his family. In prison, things took a bad turn for the Rizzuto family, and by the time Vito was released, he had lost his father, son, and so many associates. His father's death was something. While Vito was imprisoned, Nicolo, the older Rizzuto, who was well into his 80s, had stepped in to assist in running the family company. A sniper fired through the kitchen window while he was eating supper with his family. Nicola would be assassinated with a shot to the neck, eerily similar to the attack on Rocco Violi that heralded the consolidation of Rizzuto leadership all those years before. Revenge is a dish best served with blood. Vito was freed from jail less than two years after his father's murder, and after seeing his family's killing from afar, vengeance was on his mind. Vito quickly gathered some of his earlier might and began retaliating. It only took a month after his release for the blood to start flowing in Montreal. Men who were either considered to be working against the Rizzutos or just viewed as rivals were found dead one after the other. All of these fatalities occurred within the span of a month and blood continued to flow across Montreal's streets. A cancerous twist. Unlike what you would expect, Vito Rizzuto didn't die in a blaze of glory like Scarface. Instead, Rizzuto would collapse at his house in December 2013 at the age of 67. The lifelong smoker had been fighting lung cancer in secrecy. Rizzuto was transported to the hospital where he died of pneumonia on December 23, 2013. 
There will certainly never be another mafia with such influence in Canada. What do you think Rizzuto's ultimate goal was? Let us know what you think in the comments. If you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe as more exciting videos are on the way.